Happy Hogs Watch to all. I really do enjoy it when my Patreon supporters uh, go seasonal on me. Yes, this is a Patreon-sponsored review because, yeah, if you want to ensure that I watch something that you think I might not get to otherwise, you could do that through the Patreon. Okay, plug out of the way. This is a, well, <laughs> depending on what version you see, either a two-part or three-part, but other than the ways in which the episodes are divided up, I don't think it's altered otherwise, a uh, mini-series adaptation of Terry Pratchett's Discworld novel, The Hogfather. So, I had not seen this before. I have not read The Hogfather. I've only read one Discworld book to date, which was, fittingly enough, another Patreon-sponsored review. Uh, that was The Monstrous Regimen, uh, which I enjoyed quite a bit. But I, I'm not super familiar with Discworld. I know a bit about it. I know there's a lot of sort of recurrent characters and organizations and whatever, but it's not like a continuous narrative or anything across all the books that are set there. So, I didn't know a ton about this one. I could guess from some of the uh, the images I found just sort of looking up the basis to be, to be sure that I was um, finding the version that the person commissioned me to do. I immediately thought, whoa, okay, so death is going to be a major character in this. And yeah, yeah, he is. Apparently that was actually quite a thing in Discworld. Death, death got a lot of pages, like as a character. So, oh boy. How does one explain this? Oh, okay. Discworld is a world not dissimilar to, but very distinct from our own. It pulls a lot of similarities, but is very much its own place with its own rules. Um, but to give you an idea of like how big the similarities can be at times, the opening narration literally says... We open on the eve of Hog's Watch, an annual celebration not dissimilar to your Christmas. I mean, that's it. This is a bizarre fantasy Christmas movie, is what it is. So, Hog's Watch has, in place of either Father Christmas or Santa Claus, the Hog Father, who effectively does the same thing. Thing. He comes down the chimney, he leaves presents for uh, children who have left him notes, and treats, in this case, a, uh, a pie, um, like a little meat pie, and a glass of sherry. Beats cocoa. Uh, so, you know, that's, that is the idea of this holiday. Now, the premise of this story is that some people, I'm, I'm not going to try to explain... What they, there's a lot I'm not going to try to explain about this thing. But some people go to the Guild of Assassins because one of the qualities of Discworld is that virtually everything has a guild. And there is a Guild of Assassins, and they contract the Assassins to kill the Hogfather. And what then proceeds to happen over the length of the story is the Assassin assigned to it, a guy uh, by the name... <laughs> Huh. So, spelled out, his name is Mr. Tea Time, but it's pronounced, according to him, Mr. Tea Time. Uh, so, he is going through what he's going through to do, attempt to kill the Hogfather, going through some very unconventional means, because it's a very unconventional target. At the same time, we are dealing with uh, the character of Susan who is a governess babysitter type um, for some young children, and also happens to be the granddaughter of death, as in the Grim Reaper, as in the physical embodiment of death. Yo, big skeleton, cloak, scythe, that guy. Um, and death himself is wrapped up in all of this because when the Hogfather seems to disappear... He, for reasons that don't come become clear until much later, begins to take up the slack and to do the Hogfather's job because he feels that it is important that the world not lose faith and belief in him. So that's sort of your general outlined premise. Man, this thing's weird. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the nature of Discworld stories. But it's not just that it's weird. It's weird in a re 
really casual, uh, kind of deadpan way. Because so much of this is so strange, and so be and it's strange because it is familiar because it's taking all these cues from you know the world or history as we know it, but it's just like a little turned on its head with no acknowledgement that any of this is weird. So, you know, the fact that the tooth fairy is real. Yeah, no, that's just what is the case around here. Yeah, there's a there's basically a college of wizards who are supposedly the greatest thinkers in the world, but really just kind of sit around and and just potter around all day. And their solution when somebody needs help is they go, well, we've got all these potions. Why don't we mix everything together and see what happens? Like, greatest minds in the world. Wow, okay. But again, nobody comments on it. That's just this world. This is just how it is. When the little girl says that there's a monster in the basement that says it's gonna, it's gonna eat her, that's literal and real. And the governess goes down and beats it up with a poker <laughs> and throws it out of the house. That's the world we're dealing with. It's very sweetly strange in a very unassuming fashion. And it is a lot of fun. It's quite enjoyable. The cast is very good. Um, the voice of death, acted by the name of Ian Richardson, he does great work. Um, as does his assistant Albert. Susan's really good, the granddaughter who I mentioned. I was actually quite taken by Mr. Tiataime. He, his, he had the weirdest presence the strangest voice and like oftentimes just slapping a silly voice onto a character i'm like that was dumb why'd you do that but in this case it just it made them so off-putting and hard to pin down that it was kind of perfect at least for me i i read somewhere that he he's actually portrayed fairly differently from how he was in the book in terms of attitude so i can't speak to that but as a character in and of itself because like he <laughs> they're in this castle and he sees a guy and goes hi there my name's tia Taime. I will be your worst nightmare this evening. And then he stabs a guy. It, it's so, it's so weird. I like, uh, if you have a drink to hand, take, take a sip every time I say the word weird, because I'm going to say it a lot. So if I were, and here's the thing, the criticisms that I might have about this thing I'm not sure there's much that can be done about them. And what I mean by that is, if I were looking at this thing completely in a vacuum, and I didn't know it was adapted from a novel, then there are a number of things that I would bring up. The pacing of revelations about the story are very awkwardly placed in terms of at what point we learn literally anybody's motivation for doing nearly anything. It's a, it is a ways into the story before we learn the motivation of the people who hired the Assassin's Guild, why death is covering for the Hogfather, you know, why, you know, why people are behaving the way they are, why we keep cutting back to the, to the wizards at all. They don't have an active part in the story for a long time, but they keep showing up from an early point on. So those are the sorts of things I would kind of take issue with if this was created as a miniseries, but knowing it's an adaptation, I can look at those same things and go, I bet that that plays just fine on paper. Now, this is something that one of these days I'm going to devote a video to, but the, a very weird thing happens when a piece of fiction is very carefully tailored to the medium it is originally designed for. And in the case of Terry Pratchett, he's writing for a novel and he's he is designing his stories to work best in novel chapter format. Um, although he, he doesn't really do chapters, does he? As I recall. So forget the chapter thing. But like that's the format he's working with. And you can get away with things in a novel in terms of flow and the pace of information and, you know, just taking some time to just show us something that's a little vignette for this world that doesn't work as well in a forwardly propelled visual medium. Because one of the big strengths of a book, if you know how to play to it, is that people can 
basically pause at any moment. You can't actually truly control the pacing at which people take it in. Whereas in a visual medium like film and television, you have complete control of that pacing, but that pacing can bite you in the butt because it doesn't stop. So things that might be fun divergences in a novel become pace killers on screen, or at the very least, you know, make for awkward moments in terms of the overall flow of the story because you can't stop. It has constant forward momentum, even in a slow-moving story, because time doesn't stop moving as the visuals go. And there are just things that you can write in a book that when you put them in a, per in a perpetually forward-moving medium, like film and television, that they don't play as well. And I think a lot of the things that I mentioned are kind of what's going on here. Uh, in addition, the other thing you lose is the writer's voice. And I think that does impact this a bit. I would imagine it, you know, again, not having read Hogfather specifically, but having read a Discworld book and having read Good Omens, which it was written in, even though Neil Gaiman worked on it with him, was written in his style much more than Gaiman's style. Uh, the way in which Pratchett constructs words reminds me very much of Douglas Adams. And I have a feeling, if I had read... Uh, the Hogfather, that I would have similar criticisms to when I see visual adaptations of Adams's work, which is that a big part of what is so great about the book is the word choice. It's not what is being described, it's how it's being described. And Pratchett, in the one Discworld book I've read, definitely had that going for him. And that kind of always suffers when translated to a visual medium, because something that in its original on-page form has fun wordplay and neat comparisons and these metaphors, and it's like, oh, well, it's kind of like this, but then not really at all. And I don't know why I got British with that accent. I apologies to all my UK viewers. Uh, but, you know, and, but all that gets lost when all you can do is just show the thing. And I have a feeling that some of the other things that are a little weird in terms of getting my feet under me for how things are working in this world, because, you know, I don't know Discworld like the back of my hand. I have a feeling none of that stuff would have been an issue in reading the book because the narrative way in which it, things are described, the author's voice would have picked up the slack there and then removing that again, makes the general progression a little bit awkward. I strongly suspect that this miniseries is the kind of thing that I will enjoy much more on a second watch, which, do consider that a recommendation, I do plan to watch it again in the future. Um, but the reason I say that is because if you don't already know what's going on, it can, it can take you a little while to sort of get on the thing's wavelength. And now that I get it, and it, it's not like it took me to the very end of the, of the thing to get it, about halfway through I have my feet under me, but now that I get what it is, I have a feeling I will enjoy it much more on a second viewing than I did on the first. Which isn't to say I didn't enjoy the first view, I did, but I could feel sort of the way I was kind of being held at arm's length by the limitations of a visual medium, which sounds weird in my head. How is a visual medium more limited? Well, when you're dealing with a wordsmith like Pratchett, nobody's visuals are going to measure up to what he can do with words. That's not a knock on visuals, that's a praise of Pratchett. But it does mean you get a little bit of a shift and a little bit of a, oh, that's not quite working as well or as funny as it did on the page anymore because of what you lose in the, trans in the transition. That said, I am very glad that they made the decision to do a miniseries instead of trying to cram this into a two-hour movie because then, oh my god, I can't imagine it would have worked at all. So that helped minimize the issues of the pacing of it, uh, but it is such a bizarre, weird, take a shot, world that is just fun to be in. It's so familiar, yet so alien at the same time, and everyone just acting like it's perfectly normal, because of course to them it is, but that just makes, like, <sighs> Someday when I have time, I do want to read more Discworld books because the, the feel and the vibe of this is terrific. And the effects actually aren't bad either, considering this, I think, it was 2007, made for TV. I mean, the, the most obvious thing is that Death's mouth doesn't move, probably because trying to get an animatronic synced up and working and looking any good would have been too much of a hassle. Not necessarily that the effect itself would have been too expensive, but the amount of time that would add to the shooting for how many retakes you'd have to do every time the animatronic doesn't behave itself, that probably made it unfeasible. So 
that's the kind of thing where it shows its limited budget a little bit uh, because, you know, death is just this skeletal face that doesn't move. But again, the voice is great. Some of the locations are terrific. They, they get a lot out of this. This is well put together. I quite enjoyed this. And if you are looking for a new holiday thing to add to your rotation and you feel like you've seen every iteration under the sun of every Christmas Santa story, but you haven't seen this yet, add it to your plans this season. Seriously. The Hogfather, the miniseries. You seen it? What'd you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Stuff to do, of course, Patreon. It's how this video even happened. And, uh, my social media. I've got a P.O. Box if you feel like sending me something for the holidays. I mean, you know. Uh, so there, there's that. There's links to my other socials. Like, subscribe, the usual stuff. Go ahead, do it, or don't. You don't have to. At the end of the day, folks, you're the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.